I definitely drove through a tornado warning. And as somebody, I don't know if Dan from Chain Twist has mentioned this, but him and I, weather enthusiasts. We love <laughs> tornadoes and- Weather and, enthusiasts, and, that's and, new. Baby. You feeling good? Oh, I'm feeling great, how are you? Hell yeah, dude. Mm. Episode 51, something from everyone. I'm here with Justin Brown, dude. Uh, I started the show because I want to learn something from all my friends, and it's exciting to have you back, dude. We were just talking that last time you were here was like exactly a year ago, almost yes. to the day. Yep. Uh, so full circle, time's a flat fucking circle. A whole uh, circle, and it's flat. And it's been rad. I was looking back at that, and it's fun to look back at like how much things have grown since I've yep. been kind of talking about it before. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, last time we had no headphones. We were both like a quarter mile away from the mic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mics were <laughs> Amazon Basics, literally Amazon Basic mics. Literally, but you know. No, you got uh, the point across. We did. We did. Yeah. We grew. We grew. And now we're here. And it's nice to have you back, King. Thank Episode you again 51. for having me. Very Thanks humbled for to be here through, again. Dude. Thank you. Hell yeah. Uh, Justin Brown plays bass in Carnivora, Low, uh, Far Beyond Driven. Uh, that's quick Justin's plugs. My little plug here. Uh, then I'm booking music videos for the new year. So if anyone's interested in music video, fucking message me. Make something this happen. This man does some great work. I appreciate that. I promise you. Um, but I want to talk about your work right now. Thank you, sir. Uh, so for starters, we have the new single, Kaizen, yes. out for low. Uh, and that came out a week or two ago? Uh, about a week ago at this point, yeah. About a week ago. <laughs> about a week ago. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. How's that been? Oh, it's been great. It's actually been a really good response uh, oh, yeah. from not just like friends and family, of course, but also just people out of the blue. Hell and yeah. it's been uh, really nice to just hear people's feedback on it. And they're like, wow, this, this is a great sound that you have here. And just seeing comments like, this is your best work yet. Oh, and yeah. it's been a group effort, but there's definitely like the writing process of like, this guy starts with something like yep. Bert came in with the guitar riff. Justin, of course, uh, our vocalist in low J dubs. <laughs> I'm J Brown. It, it's all very confusing. So <laughs> anyway, shouldn't be allowed to do this dude. Yeah. You should only have one name per person. I know. I know. <laughs> it's he fucked should, up to double up. I know he, uh, he's older than me, but he should change his name. I, uh, dude, that just brought back the craziest, like little <laughs> niche memory of being in high school. I played tennis in high school. Uh, and so I was taking like tennis lessons and tennis lessons are in, like, it's like one teacher and like four students. Like they're kind of small yes. lessons or whatever. Uh, and somehow in this group of like, I don't know, 30 kids that they would divide into four kids each week, mm -hmm. there were two other kids named Peter who were like equally good as me. And so what they would do every week with this one fucking annoying ass teacher Here was with the three of us in a group. And his favorite thing to do is be like, hey, Peter, pick up the ball. Or, hey, Peter, we're, look at... And it's like all of us would turn... Everybody looking. And every week, he just got this sick pleasure. And it was the most annoying fucking thing in the world. We're like, first time it was funny, second time. And by the third month of it, it mm -hmm. was like... Bro, this can't be what you do all day. You have to find a better hobby. That's literally any time Justin Leach and I have worked shows together. Yep. It's gotten down to the point where it's like either, hey, uh, tall Justin, short Justin, hey. Uh, yeah. There you go. There's a distinction there. But yeah, when someone says Justin and it's at the Palladium or Webster, usually we're both looking. Yep. So. Uh, you mentioned that you weren't actually in the studio for recording the single. You were traveling at the yes, time? Yes, yes. At that time, I was just starting out uh, as a driver for Void of Vision, and they were the direct support on the Invent Animate US tour. And Fire. that was a two-week notice thing for me, basically – Helping out a good friend, saw a post on Instagram that, funny enough, another guest you've had, Jay, I saw he posted, oh, somebody needs a driver, hit him up. And he's like, hit this guy up. And it was a good friend of mine too, Bryce. Yep. And he's like, oh, wait, you follow him. Okay, you know. So I hit him up. It was like, yeah, two-week notice, hit up uh, the couple jobs that I work here locally. And they were like, yeah, go get it. And it was three weeks. I think it was like 26. Six days in total, 25 maybe, with like driving and everything. Yeah, basically start in Hartford, go to Montreal, dip your way down, go to the West Coast, down. Hell yeah. Basically did everything but the Southeast. Okay. We'll dive into that. I want to stick on the single for a second though. Yeah. So what is it like to like remotely be involved? I assume you mentioned like you were on FaceTime with the guys. So yes, and like yes. You're able to contribute, but you're not in the room for the intimate Between conversations. Between messaging yeah. and then also having the recording process. So I mentioned earlier how Bert uh, came up with the main riff. So he's the one who tracked the bass track on it. So yeah. I, tr he, he, he knows how to play a little bit of everything. He's a very talented dude, as well as everyone else in the band. But <laughs> Bert did the bass track on it, and when we got the track back, I don't know. And also, shout out to Sean, who recorded the track. Mr. Um, Sean Dalkey, Studio 86. Make it happen, Kings. Go get him. And uh, basically going back and forth, he, he had a quick turnaround time. That's why I said shout out to him. And basically in our band group chat, you know, going back and forth, sending notes, personal notes, like, hey, I think I mentioned something like, 
my little secret sauce with bass tone is if you have like drive, just throw in a little chorus afterwards. Don't make it entirely wet and fucking, mm -hmm. you know, like it's the 80s. No, no, no. Put it like there's an effect level, throw it at like 11 o'clock. You're good. And again, everyone throwing their notes, drums, guitars, yeah. vocals, uh, post production like synth in the chorus, uh, you know, just thing, little things we wanted. And yep. uh, he nailed it. And it was nice being able to message when I could, because, you know, on that <laughs> thing I was doing with Void of Vision, I was the driver. That yep. was, and that was the first tour I ever did. And you're was, basically nocturnal when you're a driver. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it was subtle because these boys, they weren't really good sleepers when the van was moving, which worked to my benefit. So yes. around 2 a.m. after the gigs every night, we'd stop at a truck stop. But okay. that's when I would send my messages to the group chat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they read them when they woke up and <laughs> maybe... Somebody in the band was up like, okay, you yeah. know, and they got the word across. So working remotely is something that I feel like no matter what you do, musicians, mm -hmm. yes, but like getting things back to people via email, via Dropbox, however you want to distribute it. Yeah, you really have to work remotely. It's like you'd love to be there, whether yep. it be the situation of tracking in a studio, but there's also times with a lot of bands where it's like, hey, man, there's times there's two dudes there and then they can't be there two weeks later when the other two dudes are there or vice versa. Mm -hmm. There's so many different situations and I'm sure a lot of the guests you've had on here along with every musician and photographer, videographer, all can agree to. I you know? just had a version of this fall through. It goes back to our conversation we were having mm -hmm. off air and I got to be a little bit vague about it because it's all still kind of current and yeah, mm -hmm. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but I got contacted by a band working with them uh, and they wanted a music video for their album that's coming out in a couple months. Yep. Uh, and the thing was like, we want a green screen video, but we can't get all of us together. So can we figure out how to do like yeah. film one guy here, film one guy here, film mm -hmm. one guy here. And ultimately it didn't end up working out because yep. they couldn't like get everyone in the same place at the same yep. time. Uh, but it was one of those like, oh fuck, this is like, this is like remote on steroids. Like I'm not just like yeah. sending feedback, but I got to also tell other people how to film yeah. this video and how to get all the other stuff set so that when it gets to me, I'm like, I have the correct ammo to then make Logistics it. Logistics can be such a bitch. Disaster. Oh my God. Uh, did you feel like you were still able to like contribute and like have your voice heard in the song? Like, I think Oh, absolutely. So I remember vividly they were tracking and I was leaving, I think it was like a Thursday or mm -hmm. something. And a couple days prior to that was the Monday where we normally practice. We normally practice on Mondays. So that day we basically ran through the song multiple times. Like mm -hmm. any rehearsal when you're about to go to a studio, you want to be well rehearsed when you go to the studio. That's cool that you had the song done before you go in. I feel like a lot of bands go to the studio and then say, well, we have this eight eight bars. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's what a lot of people will do, too. Yeah. And we've done both within this band, but also all of us individually in other projects we've been in or are currently mm -hmm. in. Sometimes you have this riff that looks good for a verse, this riff for a chorus, and maybe this cool, chuggy, weedly do breakdown thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you get to work with. And then that's where people like, say, Sean come into Jesus. play. Ah, people <laughs> are like, Sean come into play, yeah. and they are like, hey, here's what I think, here's what I hear. And it's always nice when you have a producer that has that not just open ear, but also, and this goes with anybody that you work with, yeah, that can contribute as a listener, not somebody within the band. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's always nice having that outside perspective and also yep. somebody who's a musician but hasn't heard this as, like, somebody who wrote it. I think that's know? something I always try and... I want to stay a fan of this industry. And I think the yeah. longer I work in it, the harder that is, right? When I start mm. this and I'm 16, mm. it's so easy to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed oh, all the time. 100%. And now as I spend more time in it, it becomes easier to be, like, take it too seriously and just to get jaded by it. Yes. And I think I always try and, like find things to be a fan of and a lot of times like bad soundcloud yeah. rap has been like my thing yeah but to me it's like it's important to be a fan and just remember what that is so when someone comes mm -hmm. to me it's like i don't want to talk to you about what low should be i want to talk to you like as a fan exactly here is what i am ingesting i don't know if it's accurate but like here is as neutral as very I can very be. very accurate as far as like the contribution aspect yeah. as like somebody who comes in not stepping on toes at all but yeah. like this is what i hear yep. this and you know you and somebody that you trust. So that's why somebody like Sean that we've known for, you know, well, yep. a decade now. Jesus. <laughs> Same with you. Jesus. Um, has it been 10 years since I've been on the podcast? <laughs> We're getting there, dude. Back, back to the front. Yep. Time's a flat circle. <laughs> Time's a flat fucking circle. I don't really know what that means, but I heard it. It stuck in my head. And I'm like trying to make sense of what it means. So I just keep using it as if like a, a kid who just learned a word for the first it's time. It's like how you think 2017 was three years ago. It was, dude. That's fine. <laughs> I don't want to worry about that. Just, just don't even worry about it. Just 
keep rocking your life and like you were saying be fans of things try mm-hmm. and like still have that like young mindset of like whoa yep. that's fucking cool yep. and in this industry if you work in it behind the scenes behind the big magic yeah. show that it is yep. you find things to appreciate you yes. do you really do and i i think i've also found plenty of things to like not appreciate and it's really hard for me to always like separate those two as like for me it's a 50 50 yeah it's yeah. not one way over here, one way over here. And it's, it's a disservice to lean into either one, right? Because I can mm-hmm. get jaded and negative, but I can also be too optimistic and bright eyed yes. and like not understand how this thing works. And I'm always trying to like balance those two. Like I want to be a fan, but I also don't want to be green. Like I want you to talk to yes. me and know that I know what I'm talking about. Yes. But I also still want to have that like five year old, like, ooh, ah. That is the balance. And, and weird, you yeah. have the five year old, ooh, ah, in your head, like in the yep. moment and like yep. working with like top people in the industry, like mm-hmm. especially musicians. Like, yeah. You know, working myself at the Palladium, and I'm a runner. I basically take care of the hospitality aspect. They send, you know, riders, and you know, I basically make sure the artist is comfortable on yep. the hospitality front. Used to do a ton of stage hand stuff too. So used to make sure their stage was good. Now I'm on the grocery. Make sure the towels are there, all the water bottles are oh, open. Oh man, yeah. anybody that goes to the Palladium knows they're doing. <laughs> and that's that's hundred percent. That's the key. Yeah, it's hard to like appreciate. I think all these like behind the scenes role. And before we were talking about the driving aspect of this, dude. Yeah, there's so many of these jobs that like. I still am learning, I feel like, every day of, like, new jobs and new people and new, like, Mm -hmm. half steps between this person and that person. And what I'm noticing over the years doing this, too, and it's a long time I've done this, probably creeping on eight years between stagehand and runner hospitality. Mm -hmm. They say don't meet your heroes, but it's like I want to know – Go on. How they met met their heroes. Like, did you go up to that – individual and say oh let me get a selfie oh like i've been listening to you and it's like it's cool we understand like the fan aspect but do they understand that they're just talking to another human yep just another individual i don't care if it's you know a high level uh individual in the acting realm or dude if it's tom cruise treat him like how we're talking right now yeah like dude how you doing man you know big fan and i can't tell you how many people that i've like literally known since i was five years old Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm just like, hey, you know, pleasure to work with you, man. Thank you. And I don't want a selfie. I don't want Mm -hmm. uh, an autograph. I just want the interaction. And I can't think of one time. And again, this comes down to you as an individual being able to understand body language. And does this person want to be here right now? Does this person want this conversation happening? You have to Mm -hmm. know when to be like, all right, he ain't feeling it. Like, all right. Hey, thanks, man. Have a good one. But yep. most of the time, if they're, you know, pretty cool, you just shoot the shit about anything. Like, hey, man, how's the how's the tour been? All they want is a dose of normal. They're so they, tired of being the center of attention that they just want someone to talk about the football game with and dude, not yeah. give a flying yeah, fuck about exactly. what's happening. Like, dude, Even if you don't know football. Shit? Did you see yeah. this shit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you seen this on the news today? Like yep. you turn into like Jerry Seinfeld or some uh, shit. Literally. You know, have you heard of this? You know, have you seen this? This idea of meeting your heroes is a fascinating one. I'm so it glad is, you it brought is. it up uh, because I've always what I've tried to lean into as I get mm-hmm. older is like. It's it's not disappointing that they're flawed. It's incredible that they're flawed and still superheroes on stage. Because they're human. And I'm curious, mm-hmm. like, without naming names, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure you've met one of your heroes. Like, have they been generally positive interactions, negative interactions? Like, what has your... For the most part, again, it comes back to before you even say a word. Yep. Like, you know, you look at them. Do they look busy? Do they look stressed? Do sure. they look fucking sleep deprived? Yep. This, this dude just want to have a cigarette outside of his bus <laughs> and just like... Yeah. Peer into the fucking nothing. Yep. <laughs> Outside of Let the scenic him... Webster exterior. <laughs> yes, yes. But at the end of the day, you got to realize, all right, you got to know how to read people. Some yep. people can, some people can't. But you don't want to be, I think this term's been brought up from a couple of people, but like punishing. You don't want to oh, like yeah. push this guy away. Read him. Mm-hmm. And then once you're like, hey, man, you know, big fan of your work. Um, ex- you know, if you're going to a show as a fan, you know, hey, Thanks for everything. I'm excited mm-hmm. for the gig tonight. Yep. Keep it subtle. And, you know, if the time calls for it, you know, you can ask for a selfie. But don't be, like, in their shit. Like, especially if they're already crowded with other people, why mm-hmm. add to the chaos into yep. the mix? Yep. And that's coming from, like, a staff member at venues. And I think you know? the other piece of that is because we don't know uh, – I feel like we don't know who we're going to meet in the future. And that's the other Correct. part of this yeah. is, like, yeah. as you're interacting with these people, it's like there's a, a – Decent chance you're on tour with them in two years. Oh, yeah. Whether you're driving, whether it's low, so, that make, like, whatever that is. You mentioned about like me meeting my heroes. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude, I'm friends with them. Mm-hmm. I like, go out to have a drink with them yeah. and talk about life with certain people. And it's mm-hmm. like, these are like heavy hitter, like Grammy nominated, Grammy winning, like producers and musicians. And yep. I'm just like, why the hell are you guys hanging out with me? You know, I always think, like, dude, some of mm-hmm. these people I've known for upwards of six, seven years now. And I'm like, mm-hmm. damn. 
as long as you're cool and an average, yep. just human, you know, you yep. don't treat them as like some deity or God where it's like, oh my God. Like, I understand like meeting certain people, like, mm. trust me, I have my people where it's like, I'd probably be a little like nervous yep. if I met like, I don't know, somebody in Iron Maiden or Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> I'd be like, all right, got to loosen up before I do this. But yeah, hey, thanks for, you know, and even if I met any of those individuals, same concept goes in my head. Like, hey, man, thanks for everything that you've done. You yeah. know, big fan of your work for years. Um, can't wait for the gig tonight, you know, or something along those lines. You keep it subtle. If it, Again, if it calls for selfie or picture, mm -hmm. cool. But, you know, if they can, if you could tell like, oh, they've been sick a couple of days and they're yep. haggard, get, get moving. I think the other yeah. piece of this, uh, I told a story last week mm -hmm. uh, where I'm 2016, 2017, I'm just starting to shoot shows mm -hmm. uh, and I shoot IC stars at two separate dates. And the second date, I get them to agree to take a promo with me. Yes. Uh, and the promo goes horribly wrong because I just wasn't like present. I was like starstruck and then scared to like disappoint them and scared to be honest with them. And mm -hmm. the, yeah, I told the story at length last yep. week. So I guess the short version is just that like I, the thing was too dark. And instead of saying, hey, I need to get a light and mm -hmm. to figure out to get more light, I just kind of didn't want to admit that something wasn't right. And in hindsight, it's one yeah. of those like I was trying to like protect them. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, they would have known better than anyone in the exactly. world. You would have protected them most if you said something. Right. Like you know the best I mean? thing I could have done is say like, hey, I need more light because one, mm -hmm. it says like, oh, he knows what he's doing. And two, it's like he cares enough to get it right. And yes. that would have landed so much more where in my head, all I could think is like, oh, they're going to think I'm an idiot. I think I'm going to think I'm bad. They're going to blah, 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 whatever. It, and it's one of those like, no, if I had just taken a breath and go, oh, these are four humans and they are four humans who yeah. have done more in art than I can understand right now. If anything, you know that they can adapt to these situations. Mm -hmm. You know, they've had like, all right, we'll take five and you can just, you know, post this Wouldn't up. have been a single issue. Nope, not at all. And they're used to it. Every yep. photo shoot and video shoot that they've done prior to that is 100%. that. There's nothing. Yep. <sighs> that's another thing. Every photo shoot and video shoot I've ever done, like, eh, maybe one or two. But all the others, nothing goes according to plan. <laughs> Don't, yep. like... A show at the Palladium or the Webster, or yep. most major venues, you'll have a day sheet, and it's pretty stuck too, ninety five percent of the time. Yep. But photo shoots and video shoots, for some goddamn reason, mm -hmm. it's just like, all right, Sometimes don't even bother with in. having a schedule. Just have a a basic layout and have. <laughs> yeah. And you've been good with this in the past with having mm -hmm. that wiggle room. It's like yep. we have. Hey, uh, we got to get this rolling soon. But you're really good with the communication aspect, as I, far as like, hey, let's get this rolling soon. It's, hey, we got to get going. It's not a urgent thing, but let's get moving. Yep. Meanwhile, we have 30 minutes leeway because you know how, like, <laughs> individuals work. There's, like, yep. five people. It's not asking one person to do it. I know yep. that from tour managing. It's yep. very different. But from the videographer's side, yeah. I, that is the biggest thing I've learned over yeah. the years is, like, have a schedule. And I, I feel like I have a schedule half for myself. Like, it helps just, like, yes. it helps me plan me out the too, day. Me too, dude. But it's me also too. that, like, it shows you that I care. It shows you that I've thought about what's going to happen yes. today and what this is going to do. But the other piece of that I've learned is that, like, the schedule doesn't mean shit. The schedule is what I think is going to mm -hmm. happen today. But mm -hmm. really what my job is that day is to, like, build on that. So I've learned to use the schedule as, like, a baseline. It's like, yes. here is our... If everything goes wrong, we could fall back on this, but yep. probably we're going to call an audible at some point and move stuff. And that's all good. But I can't make those like next steps if I don't have this baseline yes. set. And so even if the schedule isn't permanent, it, it's, it's important to have. It's so funny you mentioned that too, because what you just explained is exactly what I did. I hand wrote in my planner. Mm -hmm. It was all of October. I was that driver. Yep. So I wrote what day it was, what, uh, venue we were at, mm -hmm. what it was ETA to the next venue, where the Love's truck stop we were stopping at, that was mm -hmm. where everything, routing yep. for that entire month, like it's all yep. handwritten, still probably in my bag, <laughs> and just to have that baseline of like, this yep. is the plan. Yep. Hey, we have a day off, but it's a travel day. We got a 16 hour, thousand mile drive. So let's <laughs> plan accordingly. We're going to stop two to three hours, every two to three hours for fill up. Yeah. Piss, shit, get a burger, <laughs> get some Gatorade, let's go. <laughs> yeah. You have to have that, like, schedule yep. with whatever you're doing, you know. My, Again, even if it's just for yourself, mm -hmm. you have to. My version of that is my first time on tour. We go to the studio, and then we leave for tour, and this is with Call It Home. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're with uh, Zach Keel down in uh, New Orleans at the time. Yep. Uh, and he's the homie. But, at the, like, I look back, and there's a lot of content I remember from that. And in talking yep. with them, 
the number one thing that they seem to remember about me is that like on day one of the studio, we're sitting there, we're talking about like content plans. Yep. And there was like a whiteboard on the wall that was blank. And so I asked Zach, like, hey, can we use that? And he goes, sure. And on that, I wrote what we were going to film every day, when it was going to get posted, what was going to get posted, and like why Perfect. we were doing these. Perfect. And it was one of those that to me was more of like a, I'm just scared of being on tour. I just want to like let you guys know that I'm thinking about this and working on it. And to them, it was like a, Oh, okay, we're in good hands here. And it's funny to me of like I worked so hard on so many different pieces of content and so mm -hmm. many things went well and so many things went bad. Yep. And above all of that, what stuck with them was that I was organized and like present. Yep. And that's a wild like baseline that's like a that's all you need. As a runner, again, I'm sure it's the same thing. It's just like show and up and be what's kind. Great too is that you're doing it, yes, for yourself and everyone else, but mm -hmm. everyone else with whether they know it or not, they're appreciative of it. Yep. It's like a band waking like uh the Void of Vision guys and myself, yep. we were talking about it on tour, like it's just so nice when you wake up and there's a day sheet. You know, there's certain things, like, yep. say certain venues will do it, certain venues won't. And it's like, so wait, when is this happening? When's meet and greet? When's sound check? So mm -hmm. wait, when do we have to stop making noise? All of I that is it. eliminated yep. when you have a fucking day sheet. That's it, but, I don't know, it's just so funny that you mentioned that, uh, I was thinking about it, you mentioned that whiteboard. Mm -hmm. um, and having that, I wrote uh, piss or something <laughs> like that. I wrote something. I always wrote something stupid on that whiteboard. I know that whiteboard. Only the real ones know that whiteboard. I used to write the stupidest shit like, haha, 420, you know. Just Classic. Dumb shit, you know. Just like it was meant for yeah. what you would think it, what you were using it for. And I was not involved when you were out with yeah. Call It Home. It was funny because I'm talking years prior. Mm -hmm. Still the same fucking whiteboard. Yep. People were trying to be, even at that time, years, yep. years ago, when I was doing that, people were trying to use it for what it was intended for, and I'm just, like, fucking it up. <laughs> no, no shot, yeah. I'm just like, all right. But that's whatever. also the difference. We were talking about, like, uh, being outside the band and inside the band. And that's yeah, the yeah. other reason. It's like, it's nice to have someone outside the band, because inside the band, you can write piss and shit and fuck on the board, and it is funny. It's truly funny to oh, erase yeah. your day sheet and just write mm -hmm. piss. And, like, Listen, everyone else has to wake up and deal with that. It's for morale. I'm tr <laughs> trust me, it makes people go, ha-ha. It, it is valuable, but, like, that's where, yeah, having someone outside the band is also mm -hmm. a healthy thing of, like, yeah, I'm, I can't write piss shit and fuck on the board. Like, I have to write something serious. And you can. I mean, you write the serious thing. Then after, uh, fair. You know, yeah, you have to be formal and then loose. Uh, what know? stands out about driving? So you said you were there for the two weeks, and the one thing that stuck out is you said 1,000 miles in 16 hours, mm -hmm. which sounds insane to everyone else in the world but to a driver and to a band is a pretty normal thing to write yes. of like yeah we got to go from vegas to wyoming like yeah. that is what it is so a lot of tours that you'll see give or take i'd say it's about anywhere from two to five hours in between shows mm -hmm. i'd say comfortably that's you know and that's for yeah. you're not playing the same crowd you're playing the night before you're playing a, a new major city maybe a smaller city on the way to a major city mm -hmm. but then there are times where you'll notice oh they went from october 17th to october 19th that october 18th it's probably not the exact date but as an example mm -hmm. that october 18th is used to get yes to that next day yep so the whole plan is you just space it out. It's like anything in life. You can't fucking attack everything all at once. You can't yep. do it all in one go. Yep. Step by step. So it was Chicago, and then we had to get to Denver. And Fuck. Yeah. That was a thousand miles. And Oh, I don't like that at all. You basically just route it out. And again, I mentioned earlier, they were um, the sleepers that they don't like it when it's like moving. They yeah. don't sleep well. They can sleep, but they don't sleep well. Sure. So around, it was after the Chicago show. We probably left around, I don't know, midnight. And I drove to about 4 a.m. and stopped at a truck stop. And it was probably around 9 a.m. I was like, it's going to suck, but I'm going to get up at 9. We're going to get wheels rolling by 10. Yep. And I give that hour. That's so they can wake up. They can go in the truck stop. And I always stopped at like a Love's truck stop yep. or one of the major ones because you'll always find food open 24 hours, bathrooms if you want to pay like $15 to $17 and take a shower. This is the real life it's on the road it. shit. Yeah. Like people think it's like all RVs and hotels. Like, mm, yeah, you're doing <laughs> hotels every couple of days so you can do laundry and fucking have a bed. Yeah. But the van yeah. we were in was in Bent Animates, Sprinter van, high rise, so six foot two. What were they traveling in? They were traveling in a like bigger camper. Upgraded. Style. Yep. yep. Yeah, they okay. have their own camper as well. 
But for this one, they rented out to Void of Vision because they're from right. Australia. They were like, hey, can do you have a van? And they uh, let them use their Sprinter van. That's cool. I haven't heard or hadn't heard of that before. It I was a uh, Sprinter high rise van. So mm-hmm. even like the six foot something drummer could stand in it. Damn, they ripped sick. out all the shit, made bunks. It was comfy, but. You know, it was a rougher ride. Like sure. any other van, uh, bandwagon, too. They yep. can be rough rides yep. uh, due to contrary belief. <laughs> uh, unless you're in an RV, and even then, they're still pretty rough. Yeah. But it's back to the drive itself. You pace it out. You know, wake up at 9, get the wheels rolling by 10, do a couple hours. And I was fortunate with the van I was driving because every, I'd say at most, three, three and a half hours, I would have to top off on gas. It was a big tank, but again, it's five yeah. Individuals in a van plus a little bit of weight and a trailer in the back. And essentially just stopping at those, whether they realize it or not, I knew it, though, like, it helps. You get out, you walk around every three hours or so, it helps. And then you do that, you know, X amount of times <laughs> until you get to Denver. <laughs> what uh, what stands out, not necessarily from that drive, but just driving as a whole? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. was there a... You drove past the Grand Canyon. That was crazy. Mm-hmm. You saw a moose for the first time. I don't know what the fuck you could so happen. You got an I've accident done, somewhere. I've, d- I've done touring a bunch of times between tour managing, yep. playing in bands, what have you. This was the first time I ever did just straight driving. Once we got to the venue, okay. you know, I'd help the boys out, you know, get shit in. But then it's like, say, the night before or the Chicago gig. Mm-hmm. Doors were at 6 o'clock. I was like, hey, it's 5.30. I'm going to go to the van, take a melatonin gummy, and I'm going to go to sleep till about 11.30 because I knew I was going to drive yeah. and get that shit started. Yep. And it's basically just, all right, first time I get to drive on this whole run, and just seeing, like, no matter what people believe or not, you could be from anywhere in the world, if you just drive around this country, it's really beautiful. It's not flat. It's <laughs> not flat, first of all. Yeah, I always, like, anytime I go on a tour and I've <laughs> driven, a, I'm driving a vehicle that I've never driven before, yep. and I know I'm going out west, I'm like, there's some big, tall mountains that go up <laughs> and down. And when you're putting stress on an engine, you have weight, you got people and humans, in, you know, it's not just you driving. It's like, I'm worried for my life. It's like, yeah. I'm responsible for everyone <laughs> right now. And... It's not a daunting fact. That's any time yeah. you get in a vehicle. Sure. It, But again, when you're going up these hills, you have to know, and your vehicle, if you hear something, if you feel something, just pull off. Yep. You know, And that's with any vehicle in general. And I knew taking this tour from all the other tours I've done prior, oh, I would do a four-hour stint, and then the drummer of whatever band would take over. You know, there were stints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas this, I was taking care of these overseas Australian boys, <laughs> and I fucking love them. Oh, man. Could they even legally drive? Uh, Good question. I don't know. Uh, Maybe. Didn't come up, I trust them. I trust them. I trust them. I'm sure it'd be fine, but yeah, I don't even know. Do they drive on the same side of the road as us? Is it only England that's the other side or the UK? I think they might be on the other side, but again... Shout out all my Australia homies. I have none of you, but if I know anyone, I'll tell you, I've never met or interacted with an Australian that, like, sucked. (laughs) Or was like, dude, I got to get away from this guy. It was always the opposite. It's like, dude, I could hang with this individual or peoples forever. Like, yep. oh, I also tried Vegemite for the first time. That is an Australian classic, yeah. Yes, everybody swears by it. It's got everything in it. It's, you it's know. astronaut food. It's like, it is. <laughs> yeah, it it's is. boiled so, down nutrients. Hot take by itself. Mm-mm. But if you know, get some toast, <laughs> avocado, mm-hmm. and a little bit of that. Uh, Boy Division's guitar player, James. Shout out, James. Uh, he, told me that and I tried it eventually and I was like okay this is, actually, this is actually very sick so um yeah it's my boys down under they're <laughs> awesome yeah. uh any like yeah any monuments you drove anything on that specific oh, yeah, run man. that like stood out as like uh wow I'm so grateful I got to experience this you see the, the like driving. Seattle needle you mm-hmm. see things on your way that you know whether it be like <laughs> I don't know like on the drive um seeing just a thousand cows yeah. Or something. Like, yep. people that live out there, they're used to it. But I'm not talking 10 cows in Western Mass. I'm not talking mm-hmm. side of the road, Connecticut, couple cows. And yeah. the uh, person inside of me, whether I'm saying it or not, like, oh, cows. Yep. Thousand cows. <laughs> Wind turbines, thousand of them. Um, I definitely drove through a tornado warning. And as somebody, I don't know if Dan from Chain Twists have mentioned this, but him and I, 
weather enthusiast. We love <laughs> tornadoes and weather and, enthusiast. And, That's and, new. Uh, Dan and I have low key texted back and forth uh, over the year or two of like, dude, what if we went like tornado chasing in like Oklahoma? And like, he's like, hey. it's a Damn. hypothetical. <laughs> I'm shouting out so many people that like we both know that's been on this podcast, but I'm like, yeah, we're at some point, uh, Chain Twist and Low will tour, but Dan and I will probably go off over here and like chase a tornado or some shit. But yeah, um, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, uh, nothing. We're we're professionals. Trust okay. us. We know what we're doing. <laughs> You're gonna raise hell and praise Dale all the way into a tornado and be surprised oh, yeah, when yeah. you fuck around and find Listen, out. Listen, man, I I know what I'm looking at. <laughs> it's like it's like that. There's a picture of this dude mowing a lawn, and there's a tornado in the background. Yeah. The epitome of hey man, I'm just keeping an eye on it. Yeah, I see it. It's over there. That's the it's most. Not gonna be here most. in two seconds, you know. Like, <laughs> I got over, time. It's right there. Yeah. Like, but on this drive, it was actually the very end. Of course, the very end. Getting to uh, the Colorado line mm-hmm. on that fucking Chicago to Denver drive. Yep. And we were going through, I think Nebraska or some shit. Fucking sixty mile an hour winds, lightning every fucking two seconds. Yeah. I'm like. Again, back to being a weather enthusiast, I'm, like, watching, like, my radar. Like, not no fucking Apple radar. No, no, I'm, like, watching this radar that I use, and I'm, like, hmm, you know, watching the road. Like, all right, all right, I think we're good. What is your radar, dude? Put me on the scoop here. I think what? it's literally fucking called my radar. <laughs> I uh, I might be mistaken, but... You got, like, a premium subscription to this shit? Oh, hell no. They offer it, but I okay. ain't paying them. Okay. I know what I'm looking at. Back to that <laughs> shit. I, I don't need you. You don't. You're not taking my money. Yeah. It's like reading instructions. I'm a dude. I don't need to do that. But I'll do it. But I just want to let you know. <laughs> Hell yeah. So cows. Like one of my roommates in college was from Long Island, and mm-hmm. he came to UConn, which is where I went to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he described seeing a cow for the first time, just like <laughs> what the fuck. And it was one of those as a kid that was insane. so insane to me. Like. Yeah, he just had in like they don't have farms. They don't have big open grasslands. Gotta say, uh, I don't remember my first cow meeting. No. Oh, but it, I, I guess I bring that up <laughs> just like it, it's shocking how we go west and like we we realize how much of this country is that we haven't experienced. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we've, we've both had the chance to explore and travel in little pieces. But I think driving is the most like intimate way. And as the person in the driver's seat, it's that's the what most, I took that whole yeah. tour as, man. I got to see everything, you yeah. know, going from. And what was cool, too, is I basically met up with them by uh, Bradley International Airport, which is up the road from us here. And I. I started my drive up to Montreal, about five hours, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've done the border before, and they were sleeping, you know, started early, and I was like, hey, boys, Um, and this is like, I met some of them the night before at the Webster, because they had a gig there, so that was like meeting and everything, Mm -hmm. formalities, and I was like, hey, boys, you know, let's get some passports out, you know, get them all lined up, and, you know, we're through the border in, you know, 10 minutes, not even, Um, and I was with lines and shit, but again, Montreal. I love Montreal. Okay, I've never been. Put me on. Let's let's Mo- talk about Montreal. So, almost every tour, like travel aspect that I'll do, my mom's like, "Oh, what'd you like about it?" You know, she'll like send me a text or call me, and I always say, "Oh, this was cool," but Montreal's still my favorite. Montreal has great food. There's definitely that. I don't know. It feels like it's a foreign country, and when I say foreign, I mean like it's Europe. Sure. But again, mainland North America, still the same continent. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you go into a new country, Canada. But then you see the French aspect, the French influence and the French cuisine. Uh, you see how, like in America, for example, how you'll see uh, some fast food joints, you'll have English in yep. big font and then like Spanish yep. or French in very small font. Then you go there to Montreal or anywhere in the Quebec province and it's all French big font. And then if you're lucky, English font. And Gotcha. It's humbling, but it's also very inviting, you know. Yeah. I don't know what it is. And also, everywhere, it's just clean. Everybody's... That's what I've always heard. Yeah. Attractive. <laughs> it's not loud. There's not, like, people, like, slamming on their fucking horns. <laughs> um, people know how to merge. That's another thing about the whole U.S. as a whole that I noticed on that <laughs> tour and every tour. No one knows how to merge, whether it's getting onto a highway, a yield, Yield signs. Let's just talk about yield signs for a quick second. <laughs> I could nothing else. That is top of my list. Let's talk about yield, yield signs yeah, with Justin yeah, Brown. Yeah, today. it's literally highlighted. Holy shit. <laughs> so I noticed from the Australian boys, they were like, Yeah, I don't know why you guys call them yields. We call them a uh, giveaways over in Australia. I'm like, Oh my God, what if we just called them fucking giveaways? I bet you that would help everybody. Yep. Dude, no one knows how to give way. <laughs> but then you go over the border and it's like, Oh, you're doing. 60, oh, not 
kilometers per hour. What the fuck's a kilometer? I don't know. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm a dumb American. I do yeah. my best. But I, I map it out. They yeah. usually have a gauge on your speedometer. <laughs> Check it out. Um, even it out. So say if you're doing 60 and the guy getting on the highway is doing 50 and he just stays there, it's like, listen, there's a car on my left and you're trying to merge on my right. I, I'm in a van and a trailer trust, trusted by it's Australians. Yeah. So fuck off over there, please. Thank yep. you. Yes, you can honk at me. I'm an American. My uh, <laughs> my mom's from South America, and so we used to go down and visit her family every couple of years. Uh, and in Chile, I have like vivid memories of there not being like lane dividers on highways. So you'd be on like a six lane highway, which is one like Everything, we barely have six lanes here, right? So six lanes yeah. there is like a crazy like I don't know why it exists in the first place, mm. and it exists without lane dividers. And it's just like I'm I'm sure they modernized since then, but at the time it was like. What the fuck? Like, I didn't realize how, like... It can even be a how, little confusing yeah. for a novice driver, yeah. but you get into Montreal, yep. oh, man, it's the cuisine, the people. Again, yep. just... It's a nice change from your average America experience. Hell which yeah. It's just, like, especially driving, just chaos. Fucking it doesn't matter where you are. New England as a whole, yes, shit. New Jersey, New York, shit. But everywhere else is fairly tame. You get your big cities like Chicago or L.A. or anywhere around there. Any city metro. Anywhere. Dallas. It's congested. There's a lot of fucking people everywhere, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. But Montreal and Canada, man, they got it. There's some traffic Gotta everywhere. But they're doing good up there. I uh, really like that. Anything that stuck with you? Anything like anything about you that like got better by seeing the country? Like, how does... It's uh, humbling. It's always humbling. Yeah. No matter what tour you're on, but this one especially, because just doing driving, it's like you see different, you know, restaurant chains that are only to here. You see mm -hmm. um, different. <laughs> it's funny because like me being into like motorsport, you see different car culture. You yep. see what, say, vehicles are more prominent in this area. And it's like it's interesting. You see like like me personally just seeing cool vehicles on the road, simple things like that. I uh, which one, I got some advice when I was starting out, and mm -hmm. this is more like photo related. And to me, it was like I only want to shoot the bands I like. Yeah. And at some point, I get the advice, and I I, I quote this all the time. It's always stuck with me. And I have no yeah. idea where the fuck it came from, and that bums me out because whoever it was influenced me tremendously, and I wish I could give them credit for it. But the advice was like don't esther un don't underestimate the size of an audience that you're not a part of. Yes. Uh, and that's always stuck mm -hmm. with me as like. Just because I don't like something doesn't mean that people don't. And probably exactly. the audience there is way bigger than I could even fathom. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like traveling had a similar effect on you where it's like, oh, I didn't realize how like how impactful Wawa was to different parts of the world. And oh, then by yeah. Going out, you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. This is like like it, it expands your mind and makes you, I guess, kind of shrink your own perspective. Like, yes. oh, Connecticut really or Massachusetts, Connecticut, whatever, really is small compared to yes. this. And I think, yeah, traveling really reinforces that. When you realize you living in New England, like we're in Connecticut right now. Yep. But if we went on a four hour drive, we could be in Maine. Yep. Which we don't want to be in. We already we don't we don't want to be in Maine. <laughs> Maine, Maine uh, no no shade to Maine. I do love Maine, but like Maine has some like crazy shit going on. Yeah, I don't know. I love Maine. I, I the beaches. The I love the woods. The woods are fucking. I'll get cool. I'll get some some maniac on here to debate it. Maniac, with. listen. Um, best. Uh, I will throw. Uh, what is it? Mass under the bus. Though. Okay. Lobster rolls. I'm not a big fan overall. That's fucked up. You're but wrong. Maine does it better. Okay. Fair. I had a lobster, multiple lobster rolls on the Cape. Compared to Maine, they're doing it better. So shout out Maine for good and bad things. <laughs> Keep going Hell on yeah. those lobster rolls. Don't fuck them up. Uh, change of pace here completely. Uh, I know we have the Pantera cover band. So we have Far Beyond yes. Driven that you were involved in. Yes. Uh, tell me about this. Yeah, I feel like I learned about this honestly today or kind of like while looking through your Instagram oh, yeah, and figuring yeah, it out. Yeah. Uh, you've got so many bands going on. It's hard to keep up with you all the time. Yeah. What is going it's like on here? The what same, is Far Beyond Driven? different from last year, right? Yes. It's like, so what, what the fuck are you doing now? Like, everyone else. I can't keep thing. up with you. Yeah. I what is barely, Far Beyond I Driven? I can barely keep up with it. Um, so Far Beyond Driven is a couple individuals that also, again, play in their own original bands. Um, have their own, you know, say, but we all, you know, we're like, wait a second, there isn't really like a, because again, you see the Pantera Lamb of God tours that keep, mm -hmm. you know, coming around uh, and also around the world too. And I'm noticing yep. there are people that do cover bands, tribute bands, and it always comes down to, I mean, we could be talking in 1986 and it's the same thing. It's like you either give a fuck about doing it or you're going to half-ass it in mm -hmm. your job clothes that you just got from you know mm. so all being like people that 
grew up around Pantera. You know, some of the guys are a little older than me that actually got to see Pantera and like experience that. But we didn't really see anybody like there are Pantera tributes that take it seriously, but like the homework that goes into learning those songs, like everybody knows like at least one song. And whatever that one song is, as somebody who's learned it, like these are songs I grew up listening to when I was like 13, 14, primitive yep. years playing bass. Yep. And I probably learned it 60%. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I can wing yeah, it, yeah. you know? Yep. Doing the homework on this shit, it is ZZ Top turn to 11. ZZ Top and Leonard Skinner yep. turn to 11. Yep. There's bends, there's slides, speed picking as a player. It challenges me, but I fucking love it because it's an influence of mine. Mm-hmm. But it kind of formed just because we noticed all these people trying to do it, but it wasn't like being done. Like there is a weird thing that I'm sure a select few people listening to this will know, but they do this weird thing with their tuning. So they'll have things in what you would think is D standard tuning on a guitar. And I know it's going to be tough for uh, people that don't play instruments to understand, but basically when you tune a guitar dead center on the tuner, you're in tune. It's mm. usually an indicator green, green, mm. good, sure. red, <laughs> out of tune. Yep. Pretty There's always bones. a little arrow so you which way to go. Yeah. They do this weird thing where it's, I think it's a quarter note off. So if I'm dead center on tune D, I basically l- l- drop it lower, lower until it's at the very top register of C sharp. Weird. And they did that. I know a couple bands have done this mm-hmm. too. I've never heard that of is to have their own sonic space. Do they... Like listening to interviews and shit that mm-hmm. they've talked about in the past. I think it's because they wanted their own sonic space in between. C sharp and D. That's very weird. And is this uh is is it only the low string that's tuned down or is all four like are the all of them are the all increments between the strings still the same then? Yes. Okay. So, so like, it's it's the same thing. So if it's at the top register C sharp, whatever would be the and it goes the whole way. And it's I've had to like take both me and the guitar player, we've taken green gaff tape and obviously had to mark it because it's like and so it's so fucking stressful, but let me tell you the effect of it. I don't know what it is, but it just there's the sound. So if you if you have a guitar, go listen to a ring out note, yep. like a note that rings out on a Pantera song, and you try and tune it to pitch by ear, and then go to the tuner. Tell me it's not that's at weird. some weird so spot. Weird. I've never heard it, and it makes a lot. A couple of sense. bands do that. A couple bands do that. It makes sense to me in that, like, yeah, you don't want to be unique and there's only so many things and, like, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's also one of those weird things that, like, I would never pick up, like, I would never pick up on. Most fans probably wouldn't pick up on, but there's probably a, a sound that is unique to Pantera that's attributed to that. Yes. But it's one of those weird things that, like, I, it would never cross my brain that that's even an option. <clears throat> it's like, probably it's, one of the reasons so why bizarre. I wanted to do it. It was, like, that niche thing, me yeah. as a musician. I was like, shit, it's going to be tough, but I kind of want to figure it out. Does that and, fuck with you? I feel like uh, when you put your finger on the fifth fret, you're used to hearing something, and now it would sound like the fourth fret, or it sounds like you're on the weird. You know, like does it fuck with your your brain in that sense? Or if do you... every string is tuned to that pitch, mm-hmm. I'm fine. Okay. It's like if I'm in standard tuning and mm-hmm. everything's tuned to pitch, I'm fine. But if one string's out, I know which string it is. Yeah. Because all right, the rest of these are in tune because I just played a fucking chord. They're in tune, but it's this low string that's out. Let me just. Yeah. Or in between song, just you know, hit the tuner. At least what I do. But it's tough with this tuning, man. But it's yeah. you know, as long as you set your instrument up for what it's gonna be tuned for, it's all you know, the tender loving care of an instrument, it's it's part of you. You gotta fucking take care of it. So if setting it to that, learning these songs, it was a challenge, but I think it's that much more fulfilling, even in just yeah. the rehearsals before even playing the first gig. It was just like, ah, oh, shit. And the vocalist... That's really cool. His name's Jim. Uh, he has been doing a Pantera tribute probably for the last 20 years. Um, I think they probably played their last show, I don't know, 2018, 19? Everybody, you know, this guy went over here, this guy over here, you know, busy. Life, yeah. And obviously, you know, 2020 happened. And after that, you know, nothing really happened for, you know, anything Pantera-wise, then obviously they reunited. You know, they're doing like a... I consider at least my hot take with the whole Pantera reunion thing. It's like, ah, it's a celebration of life. It's people for like yeah. our age that like, eh, we would have never seen it anyway. I guess well, you know, that's the best way to see it. And yeah. for me personally, I get to see the original bass player play these songs. And sure. That's all I give a shit about. I like seeing all the other guys too, but 
there's just something about seeing him play these songs live that was fulfilling enough for me. But it all started when the guitar player kind of like came to us and was like, hey, you know, these are, I'm picking you because I think you're the guy for the job. And he's a good friend of mine. His mm-hmm. name's Ryan. And Jim, man, he's, and I was telling you about him, he's, he's done this for a while. He's, he knows these songs. And he, you know, does his own solo stuff. And he's a consistent guy. He's like, I think he's 50. I don't want to throw him under the bus. 51. <laughs> okay. And let me tell you, man, he takes care of himself as it's like, you know, his body, his mind, his health. You know, he hits the gym. He's, he's, he's good. But let me tell you, man, when, even on the first fucking rehearsal where we all four got together, you know, getting to know people is people, mm-hmm. but also you get into the first song and I hear him play and I'm playing. I'm like, oh, holy fuck, fucking shit. He sounds better than Phil now. Like, that's what fucked me up. That's I've literally cool. had interactions where I've had to drive the f- fill yeah. the singer of Pantera to the airport, you know, from the Palladium, Rock and Shock, whatever. So I've heard this dude vocal was, mm-hmm. and then I heard Jim. I'm like, Jesus Christ. This, all right, now I really got to fucking do my homework. That's sick. Uh, cover bands are a really fascinating thing to me. And I they think are, that, like, yeah. They, there's an ego in me that I think would be hesitant to join one if I was more instrumentally gifted. Mm-hmm. And I think the the counter argument there that I think is more potent is one, it's way easier to make money and sell tickets, right? You've got yes. a built in fan base Bingo. that you haven't had to earn. You can Bingo. kind of uh, assume it. And yes. especially in they the, know what they're going to see. And especially in the context of Pantera where they're on their decline now at the very least, mm-hmm. uh, where it's like, so those fans are looking for something, right? You, I don't yes. think you could do a cover band of like bring me the horizon right now. I don't think it would work the same way because bring me is still prominent enough and relevant enough that like yeah i you know what's go funny see. that you mentioned i've heard that there is some bring as, me the horizon tribute as i'm saying that i'm realizing that i was just chatting with someone who was on there uh hold was involved on in that. so we're gonna talk about more motherfuckers you've had on this podcast yep. so yep, last yep. night we're gonna keep this you know brief but last yep. night we had low practice yep and ryan's our drummer and i wish i'd use a different band name because um, i know no dude this. this is yeah. fucking perfect and you're gonna love this okay so because we're talking about cover bands yep so him and Colton, yep, they're yep, yep, both yep. they're both doing uh, yep. a cover band for Bring Me the Horizon. And just last night, mm-hmm. we had practice for Low, yep. and we ran the songs, Kaiser, and all that shit. And I think towards the end, I was like, "Hey Ryan, get a bass player for that uh, Bring Me the Horizon thing." Mm-hmm. He's like, "No, do you want to play?" I'm like, "I might, <laughs> I might." And do you want to know why I consider doing that? It's the fact of if you, and this has been happening for decades, since the fucking 70s, probably prior, all the original bands that we know, there's a lot of them that played in cover bands to fund that original project. Yes. So many. Like, I can name squillions of them right now. Yeah. So when I hear about that, yeah, it could be profitable. But at the end of the day, I think of like, shit, you think of cover bands as... ACDC, Def Leppard, that mm-hmm. 40 to 60 age demographic. It's yep. covered. Everybody fucking does it. Yeah. They do it good. Great. What about us? The 20 to 40 age demographic. And there is emo nights that are already starting to do this. And if you could, yeah. And people are kind of noticing. It's mm-hmm. a matter of how well it can be done. Yep. And what's the market like? Yes. All of us that work in this industry, we're just built like this. We can't yep. fucking help it. I can't not think this way. Yep. And I'm like, dude, first of all, all of us. Uh, Colton's like a lot younger than us. Ryan's in his, what, he's 22. I'm, I just turned 29 last month. I'm on the older side. Mm-hmm. But everybody from that 20 to 40 age demographic likes Bring Me the Horizon. I think that's the other key there is that, uh, yeah, the financial piece is the one big one. I think the other one is just like experience on stage, mm-hmm. hours on stage. And I mm-hmm. go back, uh, there's mm-hmm. a book called Outliers that I read. And it, mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to get more into reading. And that's one of the few books I've read that like really stuck with me and resonated with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in there, they describe how the Beatles, before they ever come to the States, are in the UK. And yep. they're playing like bar shows they're every night. They're playing top 40. And they're playing from like 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. Yep. Like they're just playing all night. And it's one of those that like... Yep. I don't know if that made them the Beatles, but it got them so comfortable on stage, so intimately familiar with each other, and also so intimately familiar with how songs work and yes. what that makes the crowd do. And like, well, it just enhances this understanding. I'll of name music. one band that did it perfectly, mm-hmm. and like everyone else, Pantera. Mm-hmm. They grew up playing ZZ Top, Metallica, Judas Priest, yep. Iron Maiden, and certain points they would slip in originals as the time went on. 
Uh, bands still do this. Young bands that are in cover bands, they do this too. Yep. A uh, band from my neck of the woods, Springfield Mass, Stained, it started with singer-songwriter, then this guitar player came in, and then it became a full band. And once the covers were going good, you go over, you slip in some originals, yep. people start liking the originals. Uh, you know, this formula has worked before, don't fucking fix it if it ain't broke. And I think, again, it's something that boils down to experience, and if you want to yes. be a good musician, it's... Uh, it's ignorant to think that your first attempt will be the successful yes. attempt, right? Your 10th attempt is way more likely to be successful. Yes. And to some degree, the goal is then to find nine attempts that you can mm -hmm. have. And I think cover band is one of the best ones there. It is. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it it's is, a and it, And it's fun too, because a lot of times people that play in cover bands, it's yep. already songs that for the most part we grew up with. And that's what most of the allure of playing in a cover. Hey, let's just jam on this. Yep. You can sell it. It's a matter of how you do it. Now yep. with the bring me the horizon thing, it's a niche thing, but it's how you do it. How, yeah. what support bands are we having on this? You know, how well are we doing this? Are we doing the tunings? Are we gonna go as mm -hmm. far as to play the same instruments? Some tribute, like that's the difference in my mind to a cover band and a tribute band. Cover bands, okay. I can go up in the clothes that I'm in now and just lax as hell. I'm wearing joggers, some vans, and a shirt, whatever. And I could just go play a bunch of, you know, I could play Soundgarden, some Skid Row, some 41, Blink-182, just like this. That's a cover band. Tribute bands, they go that next level, whether it be the production, the visuals, the aesthetic, the instruments, the gear. Mm -hmm. That's what, so you see like an ACDC tribute, he's playing a fucking Gibson SG out of some loud-ass Marshalls. Bass players playing a Music Man bass yeah. with a fucking Ampeg stack. Yep. Oh, shit, this cover band actually... That's me as a gear yep. nerd. When I see cover bands, I'm like, damn, they did their fucking research. To some degree, it's the same to as writing know, the schedule. To know... As, yeah. I mean, like, with the Pantera thing, it's like, I don't have this $3,000 USA-made bass and this wall of fucking Ampeg Base cabs. I have a 410 orange and a fucking Reverend mm -hmm. five string that I just recently got. Shout out Reverend guitars. Go get them. But let me tell you, dude, if I had the option, I'd have a whole fucking stack. But yep. with cover bands and tribute bands, no, nothing against either. But it's it, when you do put the money into it, this band that has the fucking same gear and the shtick and the fuck the Motley Crue tributes that oh yeah this forty to sixty year old dude is dressed yeah. up like Nikki Six in nineteen eighty eight but these motherfuckers are getting three grand tonight <laughs> yep and it's like you think about um what is it uh like original bands that's all I've done for I'd say I've been in two cover bands in my whole fucking musical career mm -hmm. and I've probably been in well over 25 plus <laughs> original bands and let me tell you about 25 concurrent <laughs> bands all at the same time I'm still in them for some reason I never checked out fuck <laughs> my mistake 25 yeah you got a list to add actually no how do you update that list without even fucking that's just crazy shit all right wizard ass so let me tell you dude the payment that original bands get Again, this comes down to how you sell yourself as an original act, and mm. this is what we want as a guarantee. This yep. is our contract, and you know, if you don't know a promoter, you would get them to do a either uh, uh, like a contract sent via email, or you, it's like, listen, just fucking sign this and send it to me. Or yeah. you know, just I'm a fucking nice. maniac. Yeah. If you tell me you're gonna pay me six hundred dollars as an original band over text, and then don't pay me, hey, that text will hold up in small claims. Thank you very much. Yeah, but. Compared to cover bands, you could be a again a person that goes up looking in just everyday clothes and get paid like eight hundred plus dollars if you play mm. three hours of two thousands radio rock. And you can go to a new bar every weekend Dude. and do that. Whereas touring, it's like you kind of how have to consistent go to a new do you want to be about it? And again, yeah. I'd love to fucking be doing the cover band shit every weekend and then yep. have like an original tour or like dates. Yep. With my with Low and all my other bands, Carnivora, I would love to do that, but. The financial aspect of like, let's fund the machine, but also I would like to personally make some money myself. Yeah, I have bills to pay and mm -hmm. and things to buy and like yep. so having that aspect of I can put some of the money I've made into the band, but also I can take some home with me. When most of the time in original bands, you get the payment as a band. Yep, it doesn't go to any of the four or five six band members that are in that band. It just goes right into the machine that is that original project you're trying yep. to sell to the public. 
Yep. It's I've had the same bitch, thought, but, but it's, like it's a bitch, but it's the real life. And you think like even your favorite local band that has all the professional setup is like living large or some shit. Like especially these younger kids. It's like, mm. let me tell you some shit. Yep. We're getting paid X Y Z, and it all goes back into it. Now, if I have a cover band, and that was again back to the allure of, oh, what if I did it? Me personally, like not even just us as like a band, but me personally, I'm like I could play bass in a Pantera tribute, and it doesn't help at all that I kind of look like the guy <laughs> Rex Brown, and it doesn't fucking help that he's got the same last name as me, or I got the same last name as him. I don't know. Maybe I could like send like maybe I could like send him papers, like serve him, <laughs> like you owe this guy eight. Uh, Ampeg bass cabs and heads. Uh, I'll take it for uh, child, uh, like 29 years of child support payments. <laughs> He's not my dad, but I mean, you know, we could we right. could figure it out. We'll cut this out of the podcast that way, like, we could do the legal shit. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. get a little 23 and me in on this mm-hmm. and like have them somehow say you're Listen, I, you don't gotta hang with me or anything, just send me a bass or two and some cabs. <laughs> That's all I want in life, anyway. Just hanging out, hell yeah, King. Um. A couple of little little notes here. Yeah. We're coming right up on our hour, which is incredible. It feels like this has been 10 minutes. We're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're 10 time minutes flies. of talkers, you know? Time flies, and that's always a good thing when time flies. Um, I want to touch on this little piece that, like, mm-hmm. uh, I'm a very anxious person. I think something we've talked about in the Yes, past me on. too. Me uh, too. I have no fingernails. It's awesome. And so one of my mantras that I've liked to, like, f- or found a lot of comfort in as I'm approaching new projects, approaching new yes. art things is, like, I'm going to make something good. How can I make it better? And yes. this was something where actually Louisiana, so not the same trip down to the call at home, but they take me, they fly me back down uh, yep. whatever year later to do some music videos for them. Mm-hmm. And I think it was one of my first times working with a label, working with like the whole, yeah, the industry side of shit. Yes. Yes. And so in that sense, it was overwhelming to me and like flying out is stressful because I like all my gear is right here. And Anything I, new can be daunting, whatever it is. Yeah. It was, it was half that it was a new daunting in the, in the audience sense, but also in like a, I'm so used to having all my toys, all my extension cords, all my surge packs, all the little stuff. Everything that, and, like Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong, I'm already prepared for it. Right. And yes, when I'm flying, yes. I can't bring all those things. Some degree, I have yeah. to boil it down to the yep. essentials and go, okay, instead of 10 lights, I can only have five. How do I make these five work in the yep. same way? And like, what, yeah, there's so many problems that arose. You and, yeah. adapt to the situation at hand. Yes. And so it was just this like stressful thing. And eventually I was sitting there like looking at my notes and I have this yellow folder that I end up writing in. Mm-hmm. And I still bring the folder to me. So that when I'm looking at the new thing, I see this reminder to myself from yes. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I just remember writing like, I'm going to make something good. How can I make it better? And it's not that good is obviously so subjective. It's not that I'm going to make something great. It's not that I'm going to make the mm-hmm. best thing ever, but I, in that moment had the confidence of like, if this is going bad, I know that I will uh, notice it in camera. I will correct. I will adjust mm-hmm. and I will end up with something that I am proud of to some capacity. Yes. And then it took a lot of stress off of me in that moment. And so instead of like, oh, I'm going to fuck this up, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. There's a music video that's going to happen tomorrow. And my only job here is to figure out how to take that from yep. an A to an A plus or a B to a B plus or whatever that increment yep. is. And there is a tremendous comfort to me. And it still is a comfort to me as mm-hmm. I approach new creative challenges of like, yeah. I'm not going to fuck it up. And if I am fucking it up, I'll notice it and I'll adjust and course correct and yep. I'll end up somewhere good. My job is to make it better. Uh, I assume that's a similar stress for you. Is there like a, is there a mantra in your head that comes on stage? How do you like fight off that, like that voice in your head telling you that you don't know how to write the song or that this bass line sucks or yeah. whatever those common thoughts are? Because we're all our own worst critics. We are. I think we've definitely talked about this before, mm-hmm. whether it be like off the podcast or on it. It's funny because how you felt I almost feel that whatever band you work for that you're shooting and you're feeling those feelings, they're feeling those same fucking feelings. And they're 100%. like, I hope this fucking guy doesn't know how nervous I am. This videographer yes. probably says yep. I'm fucking nervous or whatever yep. it might be. Or yep. thinking about something, it's the same thing, whether it be like the writing process it's like, mm. or, or contributing to a song that's being written. It's like, okay, yep. I'm in on this now. Like that was kind of last night at low practice. Like, mm-hmm okay, I'm listening to like some of the newer shit we've been working on and they've been writing on. I'm like, okay, how can I contribute as a bass player? But also like me as a bass player, I'm like, okay, I can really lock in with the guitars and really hit that left hand aspect yep. or I can really just bare bones it and fucking lock in with dr- drums, which mm-hmm. again, you notice that shit with bands like Kublai Khan, Caveman it. I swear to God. Santa just called. <laughs> fucking Caveman it. At the end of the day, four on the floor, closed hi hat, very yep. sick. Everyone loves Kublai Khan. Yep. But I think that same way, even before Kublai Khan came around, I always thought that way as a bass player. Like, okay, I'm gonna have my moments where I pop out and like have my little, mm-hmm. you know, 
here, check this out. Yeah. But then I'm like, all right, I'll still have like a stage presence, but I'm just like, I'm locked in. Mm-hmm. I'm locked into, dude, I don't care if it's one fucking note, four notes, fucking 400 notes. Yep. When it's like that part where I just want to back up, hit four notes along with the drummer while the fucking two guitar players or guitar players doing something crazier, it helps the song. Yep. It's like, and that's with whatever musician in the band, it's like, how can I contribute to the song? If I do this part, and I'll trial and error things on my own, I'm like, let's play that, and when we, we'll usually do two playthroughs of a set, mm-hmm. as an example, maybe one. But there are certain times where I'm like, let's run that back, because I want to like play one thing one way, like whether it's be with fingers, this play with a pick, mm-hmm. do I play it really noty? do I play it really simple? And it comes down to, it's like, okay, I need to stop overthinking. Mm-hmm. I need to stop. It's almost like when you were back in middle school worrying about what to wear. That's a great analogy. That is such a good analogy. But you didn't yep. fucking realize in the time that everyone else you're about to see is worried about what they're wearing and not giving a fuck what you wear. That is the best analogy, yep. That's it. Yep. That's that's what it's like. So stop stressing the little things when you could be focusing on the grand scheme of things, the great outcome, the video, the mm-hmm. fucking photo shoot, the show. Yep. And I've learned that over the last, I'd say, I've more implemented that in the last like year or two, more two years, where it's just like, I'm not stressing things. And we were talking about this before we popped on. Like, I'm not stressing about things I do not need to stress about. Mm-hmm. Is this situation, whatever the fuck it could be, could literally be anything, super good, super bad. Do I need to stress about this? Is this going to matter in two minutes, two hours, two days, two weeks, two Mm -hmm. years? Prioritize where that stress level's at, especially as we get older. Like, we still have those moments like, oh, 2017 is like three years ago. It's like, no, bro, we're about to be in 2024. I'm 29. I'll be 30 in November 2024. I've kind of realized in the last two years where I'm like, shit, I'm not stressing about this. I don't care what this person has to say unless mm-hmm. it's, you know, affecting my work or like benefiting me and what I'm doing. Yep. It's like, listen, you can think that, but I have things to worry about. Yep. Whether it be life, bills, family, friends, there's bigger things to worry about than what this is. Mm-hmm. And I try my hardest. I'm always a fucking hypocrite because it's like, Absolutely, I'll, I'll yeah. be, you know, I have those moments where it's like, I'll comfort like people or, like, say, whether it be my girlfriend or family or friends, where it's like, oh, I'll give the best fucking advice, but Jesus, why do I never put it towards myself? And I've been better in the last two years or so of, like, okay, maybe I should take my own advice because yep. it's actually been pretty valid for people I've given it to, so, like, maybe I should not stress about these little things. Whether it be, like, hey, man, um, just got a text from the tour manager. You need to go get this fucking hummus at a <laughs> sh- stop and shop. It's like, yeah. all right, cool. I'm not stressing about it. They don't need it now. You're telling me hummus is the make or break of this show? And if they do need it now, sucks. I should have asked sooner because I can't do any more than I'm going to do. um, There's a big outdoor festival. Uh, There's a ton of outdoor shit at the Palladium Outdoors. You know, it's a Mm -hmm. huge access area for thousands of people. Yeah. There was one artist that was like, can you go get us, um, it's ironic, but the Justin Chocolate, they make peanut butter. Can you go get us the peanut butter? I'm like, yeah. So I go get it. I bring it back. I wait five minutes, the fucking tour manager texts me, yeah, um, they wanted the peanut butter with the almond butter. I'm like, <laughs> well, why was this not specified? Uh, you know what? And in that moment, I was like, yep. you know what, whatever. I'm not going to get it. <laughs> yep. And I was like, who's around that could go get this? And I did like this delegation thing in my head. I'm like, yo, what are you doing right now? Yeah. Oh, I'm good for like three hours. I'm like, yo. I'll give you $5 if you do something for me right now. I shit you not. And I was like, I say, I'm not saying who, I'm not saying what they were doing, but they were free and didn't have shit to do. And I sent them to stop and shop to go get some fucking Hell almond. Because yeah. I was just like, it's a favor for me. And it's something I don't want to worry about anymore. I've decided. I've made the decision. I don't want to do with it. It's like, it's like you're at a party or a social gathering. It's like, I'm an adult. I don't have to fucking be here right now. Later, guys. Like, you can do the Irish goodbye or say, hey, I'm heading out. Like, if you're at a party or a gathering, it's like, yeah, you're there to make the appearance and see people, but you don't got to be there for three hours, four hours, five hours. It's like, hey, I got other things to do. It was great seeing all of you and getting pure anxiety. I'm going to leave. I think the other part of this that always, like, (laughs) trips me up is this, like, uh, 
I want to be great. And I don't mm-hmm. know what great mm-hmm. means. And I don't know what that looks like. And I've accepted. I wholeheartedly agree. And I've accepted that I'm not agree. Michael Jordan, that I'm not whatever that alpha A1 dog is. Or I don't I'm think not that's Dale Earnhardt. Future. You're not Michael Jordan. These are all people from Charlotte. But. Let's go. Wild. That's a you're thinking on your they feet. Also my man. You're Rick, we also have oh. Rick Flair. I lived down there until I was like fifteen, then oh. I moved up here. I forgot about that. That's that the Holy detail. Trinity of Charlotte. Ooh. Go off, um, King. Go off. Holy Trinity. That's such a funny holy trinity of people. <laughs> They're great people. <laughs> Different conversation. Um the other piece of that though is weird. It's like uh I want to be a human. You mentioned like taking care of family and friends and girlfriends yeah, and supporting absolutely. things. Like I want to do that. But I think that that is directly at odds with my desire to be great. And if I want to be yes. great, then that means I'm playing bass for 18 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And that might not be accurate, but if I am playing bass for 18 hours every day, then I'm not spending time on these other fundamental things. Yep. And I, I'm i trying to always find that balance of like, uh, I also probably can't be great if I only nurture one side of me. Like to some degree, yes. you have to nurture, you have to be a holistic human to be able to thrive in this avenue. Yes. And it's always the thing I'm like at odds with myself of like, it's so easy to work all day, and I assume for you, it's easy to play bass all day. Like it's a, it's a place you if can I hide wanted inside. To, yeah, of. yeah. If it was like, oh, I have to be great to do that, or I see the example you're putting. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I do play bass at home from time to time, mm-hmm. hour or two. But yep. say if I get to a part or a song, it's going to stress me out. Or you get to a part where, in the editing process, where it's, <sighs> I've been doing this for hours at this point, or it's three in the morning, or this one part stresses me out. I don't want to fucking possibly bad at stepping away from it i have my moments i have my moments with certain things too where it's like i just need to take a step back and when it comes to again i think more common with me is like Mm. say a certain part i'm trying to learn or uh, it's tough sometimes on bass like i'll try and like learn the guitar part like note for note Mm -hmm. exactly what they're doing like on all six strings and i try and like all right what if i half time what they're doing okay what if you know and i'm Mm -hmm. stressing myself out what if i Play one note. What if I, again, back to that conversation, play 400. It's the same but different with, say, the editing process. Yeah. And trying to come around to be like, okay, I'm going to step back from this. And, again, I've implemented that in my life, whether it be working at the Palladium, doing that fucking driving gig, working at my retail job. Like, if I interact with someone and they're just a miserable human being, hey, I'm human. I have my mus- miserable moments, too, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do my absolute best to not put it on to anybody else. Yep. And if somebody's going to do that to me, it's like, listen, man, I ain't got fucking time for that. Yep. I'm not a 15 year old kid in school. I'm not a fresh adult. I've been an adult for 10 plus years now, and I'm trying to just fucking prioritize my life and what I give a fuck about and what makes me happy. Yep. And those things are basically the umbrella. Anything else? It's like, I'll help out where I can, but I'm not stressing about something that is not my fucking issue. I like that. I think I, I think I spend a lot of time stressing about stuff that isn't my issue. <laughs> but I think I'm, I say this because I am that guy. Yeah. Years past that has, <laughs> I am stress. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a there's a part of my brain that thinks I can like strong arm everything and being better. And to some degree, you can't. To some degree, it's about waiting and letting time. Almost do the like work. being a yes man. Like yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And I've had my moments with that yep. too. Like again, yeah, I'll play bass in your band. <laughs> yeah, I'll go get you your fucking peanut butter. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But again, there's if I can do that and look like a rock star in the process, yeah. and when I say that, it's not like actual rock star. It's like if I get everything on this artist list and I treat them accordingly, they got everything and then some, and yep. that's that's looking like a rock star to me, not yeah. actually on stage. But if you look good at what you do, that's being a rock star. I like that. I like that. Be yep. great in what you, you do. Be great in what you can touch. You are a rock star. You are a rock star. I appreciate that. If you I watch me play you. drums in a moment, I promise you'll disagree with yourself so real it's damn probably quick. off camera. He's got a sick e-kit, and it's funny because Lo, uh, in the last like <laughs> month or two, got an e-kit for our practice space. So it's just been the same but different. It's like, dude, let's fucking run shit. Let's uh, do that. And like the response times on e-kits rather than acoustic kits, it's like, why did the fucking ride symbol go off on the <laughs> snare? What the fuck? All right, we got to figure that out. You know, or as a stupid example. Yep. Uh, hell yeah, man. That feels like a great place to wrap up. We are awesome. mission accomplished here. Uh, anything we want to plug before we get out of here? So obviously, uh, what's your social medias? And then what can people hire you for? Where can they contact you to hire you? I know we're yeah, so, driving, merchant, as, basin, yeah, all the good shit. For all the fun stuff, um, all my socials are at Justin Brown Base. I don't hell really yeah. use X Twitter now, but it's really just Instagram, Facebook, Justin Brown. Um, as far as contact, you can contact me through socials. I'm pretty sure emails are on there too, but you can shoot me a DM. That's totally fine. 
Uh, I'll get back to you as, as soon as I can. And then as far as the bands, got Far Beyond Driven, which is my Pantera tribute. By all means, and this also goes for Low. You can find that at Low413. If you look up on any Spotify, Apple Music, just type in Low with a period. The period is vital. Punctuation is vital. These kids these days got to learn about punctuation. So we put a goddamn period at the end. <laughs> it's Carnival- so funny to have you with 22-year-olds in your band. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. They're in my band. It's funny. I play in a band with a 22-year-old. If I'm playing with Colton, he's like almost 18. I think he's 17, right? Yeah. And I have a vocalist in my Pantera tribute who's 51. So <laughs> Full range. Music has no motherfucking age. If you're riffing and having a good time, go at it. Oh. Um, and then at Carnivora. At Carnivora Band is... Uh, the plug for my OGs and my fucking team I've been with the longest. Fire. Um, but yeah, by all means, check all of those out. Um, and all three of those bands especially, uh, we're looking to do some gigs, you know, especially on the low front. Um, if you have support slots, um, if you have, and same with Carnivora too, if you have a support slot on a major bill, um, but more so with low, we'll play your fucking basement. We'll play the fucking Palladium main stage. We'll play our grandma's nursing home, bitch. I swear, if you book us, we'll play it. But let's get some gigs together. I'd like to shout that out. Same thing with the Pantera tribute, Far Beyond Driven. Oh, if yeah. you see us as something that's going to help your venue out as a cover band or we can add to your lineup, please let us know. Thank you. Fire. Absolutely. Um, I got to start saying this earlier, but I was think- realizing the other day that like this show is still small enough that... like. If you are listening to this and you like the video, mm-hmm. it impacts me. Like YouTubers are always asking, like, like the video. Oh, yeah. I, to some degree, they're talking to the masses, and I'm yep. talking to like you specifically, like, you as the one person hey. listening. Like this shit is small oh, enough that camera. like your yeah, single you. click can still affect this show trajectory and its ability to get shown to other people and send to other people. If you haven't so, noticed, the algorithm is an absolute maniac on all social platforms. So whatever you're listening to this on, whatever you're watching this on, whatever I do, whatever he does. Just like and share, and this yep. goes for your favorite local bands and photographers and videographers that yep. you support. Literally, just share it to your fucking story, and I shit you not, it will help. Literally, if you want, buy merch. If you don't want to support me publicly, just leave a rating on Spotify. Literally, just click keep watching and do nothing, and fucking go make a sandwich. Pretty much. There you go. That's it. Go make a fucking sandwich. Go make a sandwich. <laughs> Maybe the keep watching part is more important there. But keep watching, like but make a sandwich, sandwich after. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Episode 51 of the books. Justin Brown, thanks for coming through, King. Rock and roll, baby. Thank you.